Some of y'all have yet to eat dried mango with some cheese and it shows. Elevate. Hello everyone. If you're new around here, welcome. If you're not new around here, what is up home skillet biscuit? It's me, Kendall. Before I get started, and y'all gonna be so mad at me because I bring up shows that I'm watching all the time and I never get around to actually making a video. I'm, I'm working on it, okay? I just got finished watching The Ultimatum. Bitch. They had the final episode in the reunion. Messy. You ever seen a show about people who wanna get married and nobody should get married? Ah, that'll be midweek because I'm working on it. <laughs> Hopefully <laughs> midweek, we'll see. But today's Saturday and Saturday is when I do a little something on my channel called Bad Movies in a Beat, the series on my channel where I talk about bad movies while putting my makeup on. And today, don't hate me. <laughs> don't, because I know how to hive get. Y'all real, y'all like to tussle. We're talking about Beyonce. Um, which is the first time we've discussed her on bad movies. But before we get into that, uh, we got bills to pay. So I'll right, send that over to Adroll who's securing us a bag. Thank you. <laughs> Hello everyone. I guess this is just how I look during <laughs> ad reads at this point. <laughs> Hello everyone. It's Adroll Kenny to let you know that today's video is sponsored by HelloFresh, America's number one meal kit delivery service that allows you to eat fresh, delicious, and healthy meals straight from the comfort of your own home with the deliveries that are sent straight to your doorstep. You can save money, you can save time with pre-packaged and pre-measured out ingredients that you spend less time dealing with, less time shopping for, and don't have to go to the grocery store. I am so spoiled now at this point since the pandemic. I just don't like going in to grocery stores anymore. HelloFresh is a great way to get everything super convenient for me so that several meals out of the week are already planned for, already shopped for, already measured for. Thank you. There's like a million and a half different recipes on HelloFresh, some of which I make even when I don't have HelloFresh because they, because the recipes are that simple, easy, and delicious. They have me falling in love with new ingredients that I never really considered. One of which, barramundi. I didn't know what that was, but it's a very good fish. Two, they have me in love with like a quick pickle. I discovered cavatappi. It's my new favorite pasta. I didn't even know what that was. But it's quick and simple. You can get most meals on the table in under 30 minutes. If you're like me and OG, you can probably get them done in about 20 now. It's just a great way to take the stress out of figuring out what you're gonna make for dinner. You can always customize your meals, add more proteins, add desserts. I saw in there that they have a peanut butter lava cake now. Oh, I'm tempted. I'm trying to be good. <laughs> but sometimes I wanna be bad. <laughs> so if you would like to check out HelloFresh, feel free to check them out at hellofresh.com. Use code Kenny16 to get 16 free meals, plus three surprise gifts. Big thanks again to HelloFresh for sponsoring today's video. Now let's get on to the debauchery. Last week we talked about um, an instant classic, a work of art even. We talked about a film that I found on Tubi, which is of course where everything great and awful goes to live and die. My side piece hit the lotto. I think that's the first time I said that correctly the first time, because usually it's side chick, won the lotto. I digress. It had uh, Mama D and apparently somebody that y'all knew that I didn't to uh, a Southern family reunion legend, apparently, Pokey Bear. So um, it was a mess. And uh, I've also been made aware that apparently it's a sequel. But if you would like to check that out, that'll be linked up above, or you can check it out in the Bat Movies in a Beat playlist. Beyonce, Beyonce, all on his mouth like liquor. Sound like Mac does it. Today we're talking about Obsessed, 2009. The beautiful, incredibly talented living legend herself. Voice of an angel, body of a goddess, voice of our generation, everything great. A woman who is incredibly talented in most ways because she's so good at so many things uh, as a society, we like to accumulatively uh, ignore the, the phase in her career where she was, you know, seemingly putting a effort forth acting. I think it's actually quite, uh, humbling because you can be good at almost everything, but you can't be good at everything, you know? And sometimes that's the lesson that we have, especially as a perfectionist, we have to know and accept is that some things you're just not good at. This is where we discover some things that Beyonce isn't best at, and that is acting. <laughs> I think it's actually really funny considering 
or fascinating even to some degree considering Beyonce's entire career is being on stage, right? And honing a sort of stage persona that works marvelously well on stage and in video, uh, as in like music videos. So I guess to some degree you would imagine that acting on the big screen, for instance, would come quite naturally to her. However, <laughs> wasn't Beyonce's strongest talent. And for the most part, I see that she's kind of accepted that. Now, with that said, <laughs> because she tried, you know, we still have gems like Obsessed. Obsessed is a 2009 psychological thriller, much in the vein of like a fatal attraction in which Beyonce and hairless Idris Elba Child, please tell men to stop shaving. I'm so tired of doing like a general PSA that when y'all shave off facial hair, y'all look like toes. But I've never, I'll just say this. I've never seen a man look better by shaving his face. <laughs> I've seen men look equally as good, um, which just seems like more work to me. Like if I was a dude, I wouldn't shave my face. But anyway, clean shaven Aegis Elba. They play a married couple and Aegis Elba is uh, subsequently terrorized by his new temp, um, who's helping him out in his office, played by Allie Later, Larder, um, and she begins to sexually harass him throughout the job and becomes obsessed with him as he continually turns her down because he's a happily married man. And this is such a 2009 movie. Can you imagine if this came out like right now? The, uh, the TL would go ablaze. Especially after Becky with the good hair, there would be a revolution. Now, as I've kind of said in passing over the years, I really love a Fatal Attraction-esque movie, the, the stalker movie. I don't know. I know it's not healthy. I know it's not good, but in the same vein as people who entertain true crime documentaries, which is also me, um, I find it fascinating. It's a guilty pleasure. So combining that with an A-list celebrity, who's only recently jumping into film at the time, um, well, maybe within the last five, six years, was jumping into film at the time, which isn't actually, now that I say that, she didn't have a lot of excuse. She had done a few other things at this point, hadn't she? Beyonce's in it. <laughs> and it's Fatal Attraction, you know, inspired, you know. And I was into movies like that back then as well. So I was like, oh, this sounds like a fun time. So I remember watching it in, not remembering a whole lot about it, except for one specific scene. <laughs> and I can quote it to this day, cause it's it was peak Beyonce acting. Other than that, I remembered it being vaguely Fatal Attraction-esque and beyond that, not being particularly memorable. But having revisited this film now, um, it's a lot grosser than I remember it being. And you know, being that it's a psychological thriller about an obsessed woman who is harassing this man, um, that shouldn't surprise me. I will say that uh, when we get to the end for me, it's a lot more cathartic <laughs> than I expected it to be. Cause th these movies are quite formulaic. You know that it's gonna be someone overstepping a lot of boundaries to the point that it's concerning. And then there's gonna be this like final, like, no, you're not doing this anymore. There's going to be a tussle. Uh, she's gonna die in some dramatic way and uh, roll credits, they'll be back together and that'll be the end. Um, I will say I really like Beyonce and like the ginger hair, the red hair. I uh, kind of wish she would do it more often. But uh, with that said, it other than that or any like social commentary I can kind of bring from it, it's just something to watch, something to consider viewing, something that would sufficiently fill up a television screen. And theoretically no one in the next room would be like, turn that shit off. And that's about the highest alkylades I could really give the film. It's Fatal Attraction with Beyonce. And whether or not that makes it better or worse is ultimately what you're going to the film for. But anyway, without a further ado, this is Beyonce's Obsessed. 2009. So our main female lead, of course, played by Beyonce is Sharon. And it's just funny seeing Beyonce named Sharon. I don't, <laughs> like, it's just like, okay. And her husband, of course, again, played by Idris Elba, is um, Derek. They are a young married couple. They have a young son and they recently moved into a new house. <laughs> if you watch these scenes on mute, 
uh, you can kind of get the quality of acting that I'm referring to when Beyonce does anything that doesn't have music in the background. It is bad in a more subtle way than some other videos that I've done before. It just very much so reads when she's on screen as if she's trying to uh, transport the methodical choreography that she uses on stage or in music videos and apply that to acting and something about it makes it look so insecure, <laughs> if that makes sense. And stiff really does show that when Beyonce is performing, it isn't so much of a, an artifice, a, a, a new person. It's just that's Beyonce in Beyonce mode versus Beyonce in a mode that she's not particularly comfortable with. She's not a good liar. <laughs> she's not a good actress. So she's like, you know what? I know my talents. I know what I can and can't do. I'm not gonna talk to y'all anymore. But I remember when I first watched this movie, my mom said something that really brought my attention to it. And that's, she acts as if she's getting ready to sing. Like she's just doing like a spoken intro and, she, but she never sings. <laughs> but anyway, her husband, Derek is a businessman of some sort. They never really say he does. He, he wears a suit and he has an office and something vaguely in regards to buying things and stock, I don't know. But whatever he does, uh, you know, he earns a bit of money, has a bit of power by way of that money. And he's also known to be somewhat of a ladies man, at least before he got married. Um, as a matter of fact, that's how he ended up meeting Sharon. <laughs> this is Sharon. Because she was originally his uh, secretary and they hit it off and the rest is history. Now they're married, have a baby, what have you. But in comes the new temp, Lisa. She and Derek end up meeting in the elevator um, on his way to his office. And while in the elevator, they share polite banter, maybe a few passing glances, you know? And I think it's fair to say that Derek is noticing her beauty, um, but I wouldn't say anything that goes into like inappropriate crossing the line territory, you know what I mean? It's just, you know, People are attractive. People do be sexy sometimes, and what can you do? And other people in the office also notice that she's attractive. It becomes somewhat of a talk of the town, particularly among the boys. You know. It is very apparent that from the beginning, she seems to have a bit of a crush on Derek, but he doesn't seem to think much of it because A, she's a temp, she won't be there very long, and B, also, he's married to Beyonce. But alas, Another day passes and she's still there. She hands him a memo for an upcoming business Christmas party that would be happening later that week on Friday. Apparently it's customary to not invite spouses to this party. And Lisa asks why that is. Derek says that it's just customary because it's hard to cut loose. You know, everybody wants to have fun and apparently you can't do that with a person you devoted your entire life to, I guess, I don't know. This is looking a lot more patriotic than I was going for. But he insists that the parties don't get wild or anything. It's just custom to not invite your spouses. But we as the audience can see very quickly that um, our girl is taking a liking to him. She knows a bit too much about her job already. She knows a bit too much about how he likes to take his coffee. She's ahead of everything that he needs for the job. She's very efficient and effective and impressive at her job already. Now Sharon hears that there's a new temp and being that that's kind of how, <laughs> that was kind of how her gig got started, she's like, who's the new girl. Again, he's known for being a flirt around the office and also they met while she was his secretary. So she's like, I don't like that. Lisa comes in, meets Sharon, meets the baby. You can kind of tell automatically that Sharon just kind of has some bad vibes around, around Miss Lisa. But she decides to let it go. Again, she is a temp. She won't be there very long. So theoretically, she could be making a big deal out of nothing for a person that's about to leave anyway. But as these movies go, Lisa's already doing her fatal attraction downward spiral. It's the little things at first, the small things at first. You know, she goes through a CDs. She sits at his desk. She makes him a mixtape of his favorite songs based off of the CD collection that she um, went through. And also she's still there the next day, you know, for a temporary person, you've been here for a while. One day, Derek finds Lisa crying in the kitchen of the office. Apparently she just had some men trouble, girl, don't we all? And uh, you know, Derek is polite and gives her, you know, the whole pep talk. There's other fish in the sea and you know, you're a beautiful woman, you know, don't 
take it so hard, blah, blah, blah. You know, it wasn't meant to be. There's someone else there out there better for you. This guy just wasn't right for you. You know, nothing that's strange or feels like it oversteps into inappropriate, at least in my opinion. Well, not at first. Any man would be lucky to have you. Yeah, right. Oh, honestly, if, if I were single. But you're not. Where's my gavel? Objection, move along. And Lisa's um, having this delusional fantasy of them together because she views him as sort of a knight in shining arbor. She's like, I'm starting to believe all the good ones are taken. I'm jealous of your wife. She has everything, the perfect husband, perfect child, marriage. It is the day of that aforementioned Christmas party with no spouses. And right before it, Derek is getting a drink at the bar or a burger at the bar or something. And here comes Lisa to sit next to him. They have friendly chatter, but somewhere along the line, Lisa's like, oh, we need to get some alcohol in you. And he's like, no, if I have a shot, I'm gonna, you know, have my tie around my head and it's gonna go crazy. Lo and behold, he does drink quite a bit. They start drinking and things get a little bit wild to the extent that you start to wonder like, oh, is he gonna like make out with Lisa under the mistletoe? But even still, he's like, nope, peace. Get out my face, bitch. I'm about to go take a piss and I'm going home. Well, he's not rude about it, but he's just like, nope. <laughs> Peace out. Here comes Lisa's delusional ass coming in there like, oh, this is my time to like stake my claim. I'm gonna go for it. So she goes into the men's bathroom, tries to uh, get something started with Derek, who's like, what the f Get the f off of me. And he's panicking, one, because she's trying to assault him, and two, because if they hear them there, his colleagues could hear that would not be good. He's able to push her off. And she's like thoroughly confused. It's like, I'm a thin, pretty white woman. I've never gotten denied in my life. What is wrong with your crazy ass? I told you I'm married, leave me alone. Now, as a Negro in 2022, uh, this scene again would have launched many a social debate in the midst of the TL. Think pieces, if you will. Again, I shudder to think about it. A blonde white woman throwing herself at a dark skinned black man who rejects her, you know, race, gender, misogyny, sexual violence, the discourse would make the world implode. But anyway, shaken by the night, but deciding to not go to human resources or anything, he just goes back home. Sharon asks how the party was, did anything happen? And he's like, no, nothing. And she's like, okay, she half sleep anyway. She don't know what's going on. Now, him denying that anything happened confused me at first because what benefit does he get from that? But then I realized the patriarchy benefits no one. For him to say that he was assaulted, particularly by a woman, particularly by a beautiful woman, he would feel embarrassed to admit that for some reason. As we'll discover throughout the movie, none of his colleagues really take it seriously. And it's just really up. It's really bad. Anyway, being that she's been outright rejected, you would think she got the hint. But no, things are just slightly awkward when she comes to work the next day. But that doesn't stop her crazy ass from going into his car in the parking lot and stripping for him. He yells at her to get the f out of his car. Oh my God, Mandingo threw me out of his car? Me? Pretty thin white woman? You threw me out of your car, you porch monkey? This jungle monkey told me that I'm not entitled to BBC? Madness, truly. Again, the T.O. would go insane. So anyway, he comes back home and I think he's finally at his rope where he's like, I need to tell my wife that this lady is being awful. But when he gets home, Sharon has just gotten off the phone with her sister who was in a very, very bad place because her husband cheated on her and is leaving her alone with her three kids. And because of that, he's like, my thing doesn't matter. <laughs> Instead, he goes to his coworker, a male coworker, about how he's being harassed by this woman. Again, all of them are just kind of like, well, is she hot? Ooh, again. Patriarchy don't help anybody. Boom, boom, boom. Rape culture, boom, boom, boom. Sucks. Seemingly, uh, Derek has avoided the main issues with Lisa because for some reason, unbeknownst to him, the temp agency that hired her has asked her not to come back for some reason that we don't know. It's possible that she has been exhibiting erratic behavior in regards to that as well. And so because of that, he's like, well, she's gone. I'm not even gonna tell the higher ups, like the bigger 
human resources people about her behavior at all because why do I need to? So he spends a happy Christmas and New Year with his wife and child. And right when he thinks life is back to normal, Lisa sends him a bunch of very 2009 selfies. We were walking around with fedoras and pearls, like together. You ever see those memes where people were like middle schoolers in 2009 were dressed business casual and it hurt my soul because we were. Yeah, she's still around. It is call obsessed after all. It, it wouldn't be call obsessed if she was like, maybe I should like not. He sends her an email to officially tell her, I guess outside of saying, get the fuck out of my face, that he would like her to leave him alone and never talk to him again. She sends an ominous smiley face. There ends up being a business retreat for Derek. And guess who the fuck shows up? Lisa. And this, it gets dark because she goes straight up Lisa Cosby and his friends are able to get him back to his room just thinking that he's really, really drunk. And she comes in, Cosby, yeah, f this bitch. It's not like I didn't want people to beat her ass already, but it's just like, you know, final nail. Where's my gavel? nail in the coffin. He wakes up late for his meeting the next morning. She tells the front desk, hey, can you get my husband to come up here? And so he comes out of the meeting that he just got to five minutes ago, unshaven, didn't brush his teeth, did nothing. He leaves his meeting and guess who it is? Every time you show her, you're not surprised, but you're just like, yes, it's still this bitch. Why are you acting like we're strangers? Are you acting like last night didn't happen? The moments in the elevator, you told me that she would leave your wife for me. And then that's when we realized that she's, I mean, we knew that she was delusional, but to what degree it's like, oh, you're literally living in a world that does not exist. That's terrifying. He says for the million time that nothing is going on between them and that there has never been anything going on between them. So this time, she takes the path of the scorn non-lover. She goes to his bed, takes a bunch of pills and tries to kill herself. And when he finds her in his bed unconscious, he don't just think, sometimes blessings come in ways that we don't expect. Sometimes blessings comes in ways that we don't see coming. But instead he calls the ambulance because I guess he's a good person. I'm. I'm <laughs> Apparently not. Sharon calls his uh, coworker because she hasn't heard from him in a bit. And he says that there was an incident and that he'd prefer not to tell her what had happened himself. He'd prefer to have Derek say it to his wife. So Sharon rushes down to the hospital, um, which apparently wasn't further away. I thought <laughs> when they went on a retreat, I thought they were like in Jamaica. I didn't know that the island they went to was in state. But Sharon gets to the hospital afraid that something happens. And while there, a detective comes to question Derek about his relationship with Lisa. Again, Sharon knows nothing about this outside of some womanly instincts. And again, Beyonce. Listen, Sharon, all I wanna do. What, hey. what, what, Derek? What? What do you want? I just. It does a good job. <laughs> she, she does a great job. Beyonce job. Anytime she has any heightened emotion, you think she's gonna break out into song and then it never comes. And then it's just like being blue balled. I don't know you. I don't know you. I know the Derek that told me everything. Come on. Two. Love is such a I have no idea who you are. Sharon, I was wrong. If I hadn't gone to the ER, if I hadn't called Ben, would you have even told me about this? You're crazy. Of course I would have told you. With that said, I did like the Four Seasons line. I thought whoever wrote that one, that was that was cool. You need me get your ass and out of here. And go where, Sharon? To hell. But until then, I suggest maybe the Four Seasons. Okay, that was good that time. It's just, she's just inconsistent. We just need the consistency up. But Lisa's still in the hospital on watch because of her being a risk to herself. And in comes the detective again to get to know a bit of her side of the story more. And we start to get the vibe that the detective feels like something isn't quite right. I don't know what you needed a vibe for. I don't think it takes a rocket scientist to know that she's not in the best mental space right now. <laughs> Because even if you don't know anything about her, you know that a woman who had an affair with a man for about two weeks uh, took it so hard when it ended that she nearly tried to kill herself. Obviously, that was like the final straw. With that said, she's lucid enough to, you know, give her side of the story. Um, and she's like, ooh, I love this man and he loves me. And he, look, he sent me flowers. And the detective, you know, listens 
because what else can you do? Meanwhile, Derek is getting grilled at work because they're concerned about any impropriety around Lisa because again, a woman who has known him for a bit, who's claiming that they had a sexual relationship, just tried to kill herself. And his bosses are like, there better not be any impropriety because we could have a sexual harassment suit. And he's like, I was the one that was sexually harassed. Um, and every man around him, patriarchy. <laughs> they're completely undermining that aspect entirely. And they're like, okay, whatever. The detective again comes in to see Derek this time. She gives him the journal that Lisa had of all of the wonderful sex escapade that they did not have. But after she's discharged from the hospital, Lisa's sister apparently uh, takes her up north because, she, you know, again, this sounds like someone who has a pattern of erratic and obsessive behavior. So again, Derek's kind of in this place where he's like, I guess I won't get a restraining order. She's gone. I just want to act like she doesn't exist. And within that time, him and Sharon slowly rebuild the trust in their relationship. They decide to work it out, end up officially making up at his birthday dinner, but back at the house. Guess who lies to the babysitter that she was supposed to come over and visit the child and then ends up stealing the baby. <laughs> They do end up finding the child in the backseat of the car. She was obviously doing it to scare them. But at this point they're like, okay, we're gonna get a security system for the house. And also Beyonce delivers the line that over the past over 10 years it's been since this movie's come out, I can still quote to this day. It is also a very Beyonce acting performance. You came into my house. You touched my child. You think you're crazy? I'll show you crazy. Just try me, bitch. You better try me. So after sending her voicemail over to Lisa on a different day, she goes out of the house and forgets to turn on the alarm system. And then she's like, oh, let me go turn the alarm back on. So she comes back to the house and guess who's in their bed in his jersey, throwing rose petals all over the house. And finally, we as an audience get to see the beautifully cathartic scene in which uh, Beyonce beats her ass. Derek calls during the fight and of course, Lisa's delusional ass goes, it's like, baby, it's fine. Uh, they tussle for a bit, Beyonce gets the phone and she's like, I had to call you back cause I'm about to beat this bitch ass. It culminates all into a final scene in which Lisa falls through the attic. And again, they both better people than I am. She tries to help her up. My hands sweat. I don't wanna get that on you. Just trying to be considerate. And Lisa, who doesn't use this as an opportunity to try to get up, tries to pull Sharon down with her. And she was like, oh wow, I'm shocked that this woman's crazy. Eventually she gets her to let go. She goes crashing to the floor to her death. Well. That, that'll do it. Um, and that's the end of the movie. Is it a new innovative take on this same like fatal attraction trope? No, it just has Beyonce in it. <laughs> which made it worth watching, okay? I got what I was expecting going into this movie, nothing more, nothing less. And it still, you know, reigns within that uh, subcategory of guilty pleasure movies that are fatal attraction adjacent. But that is all for today, folks. If you liked today's video, feel free to like today's video. Follow me on all of my social media, Instagram, Twitter, both of which are Kenny JD. Check me out on More Butter. I have a podcast over there and I also uh, chill with Mr. Gigi and Amanda the Jedi occasionally as well. So if you wanna check that out, where I talk about more movies. If you have more bad movies, I've been forgetting to ask you guys. If you have more bad movies, feel free to put those down in the comment section. I love to see them. And I will see you guys next time. Bye.